Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Susie Sisson, and I'm the chair of the English department at Marion High School in Omaha, Nebraska. This year, the three Catholic girls' schools in Omaha, Marion, Mercy, and Duchenne, are collaborating on a series of events centered on women's leadership and the power of women's voices. In particular, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the adoption of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution. Today's webinar is the second event we have hosted this year. We are recording today's conversation on November 3rd, 2020, Election Day in the United States. It is the perfect time for us to hear from a group of women who have devoted their lives to public service. A little bit about how today's presentation will run. Um, it will be a conversation among four women facilitated by a moderator. It will last for one hour. The questions we will ask our panelists were written by students and submitted ahead of time. There really won't be opportunities for you to ask questions during the panel today, but we encourage you to take notes and to continue the conversation with your classmates, teachers, families, and friends after today's presentation. So before we get started, I would like to introduce our panelists and moderator. Senator Sarah Howard is a 1999 graduate of Duchenne Academy. She graduated from Smith College and Loyola University of Chicago School of Law. She was elected to the Nebraska legislature in 2012 and reelected in 2016. And she serves as the, as the chair of the Health and Human Services Committee. Alicia Shelton is the graduate of Xavier University and holds two master's degrees from Bellevue University. She is an integrative therapist at Omaha Integrative Care. She ran for election in the US Senate to represent Nebraska and lost in the Democratic primary in May 2020. Teresa Thibodeau is a graduate of the University of Nebraska Omaha. She worked for several years in corporate human resources and now owns and operates the Primrose School of La Vista. In 2017, she was appointed to the City of Omaha's personnel board and to an open position in the Nebraska State Legislature. Katie Waldo is a 2003 graduate of Mercy High School. She graduated from Creighton University. In 2008, she worked as an operations director for the, Ob for the Obama campaign and later served as the White House trip manager where she managed logistics for President Obama's trips on Air Force One. She currently serves as head of community impact at We the Action, a group that connects lawyers to nonprofit organizations. Dr. Diane Bystrom is a graduate of Kearney State College and the University of Oklahoma. She directed the Carrie Chapman Catt Center for Women in Politics at Iowa State University for 22 years before retiring in 2018. She also established Iowa State's Leadership Studies Program and served as its director for 10 years. Dr. Bystrom is currently serving as the co-president of the League of Women Voters of Nebraska. One thing all of these women have in common is a deep commitment to public service. It would have taken me several more minutes to list all of their volunteer contributions and the many ways they're involved in their communities. The fact that they're here with us today is a testament to their commitment to serving others. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Bystrom and get this conversation started. Well, thank you, Ms. Susan. And what we'll be doing today, I really appreciate all the questions turned in by the students. And so we only have an hour's program. So I sifted through them and we'll be asking some questions to all the panelists and others just to two panelists or one panelist. And I'll call on people as we go along. Uh, so the first question, and, and uh, three, uh, Ms. Thibodeau, I'm going to call on you first. The first question, which all of you will answer, is what motivated you to become in politics, to become involved in politics? And please can I try to keep your answers to a couple of minutes. Thank you. Yes. And first, I do want to thank Ms. Sisson and all of the girls involved on this committee. Uh, I do have to acknowledge my daughter, Anna, who is watching right now remotely at Duchenne. Hi, Anna. Uh, but with that, thank you all very much. This is such a great day and so important uh, for our young women. And one of the reasons I did get motivated to become involved in politics 
was I was always an informed voter. I always paid attention. However, I did help my sister in her campaign when she first ran for city council. And as we went out and we talked to community members and as we got more involved, it became apparent to me how important it is to talk with your community and make sure that if you want to see change or if you want to support somebody or another person, it's very important to stay behind that person, to get that information out there and to let everybody know it's hard to find out who the candidates really are these days. And so my involvement is so that I can talk one-on-one -on -one with people and let them know uh, whichever candidate I am supporting, what they are about. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Thibodeau. And Ms. Waldo, we'll have you go next with um, what motivated you to become involved in politics. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so when my grandpa babysat me as a kid, we watched Chicago Cubs on TV. Uh, and when my grandma was in charge, we watched CNN. So my joke is that that probably had something to do with me falling in love with politics after meeting a certain politician from Chicago. Uh, but the actual truth is uh, I was motivated by a teacher at Mercy. Um, we kept in touch after I graduated. And I remember her telling me about this state senator from Chicago named Barack Obama. Uh, she sent me the speech that he delivered at the Democratic National Convention uh, in, in Boston in 2004. And I think she said something like, you know, keep an eye on this guy. I think he's going places. Uh, so I, I watched that speech and, you know, it was unlike probably anything I'd ever seen before from a politician. Uh, you know, it was about how unlikely it was for, for him to be on that stage at all. And it was about hope in the face of uncertainty. Um, and, it, you know, it was just really inspiring. And it stayed with me until I graduated from college in 2007. Uh, and that speech is probably the reason I decided to take that risk and uh, move to Iowa and to start working on his presidential campaign um, as an unpaid intern at first. Um, and that started this 10 year journey that, that took me to the White House where I had the privilege of traveling the world with President Obama. Um, so, you know, that's how I got in, involved and I realized I, I have mercy to thank for it. Thank you, Ms. Waldo. And I'm gonna put a, a point here. I assume though, you know Jackie Norris? I do know Jackie, <laughs> yes. She was a graduate student of mine, small world. Oh, all wonderful. At the time. Uh, so Senator Howard, what motivated you to get involved in uh, politics? Uh, well, first off, I will echo uh, uh, Teresa's uh, thanks to everybody who put this together and Ms. Sisson for doing that and give a shout out to Mr. Schroeder, my husband over at Duchenne. Um, I will admit that I did not think that running for office or politics was my path at all. I, uh, I was raised by my mom who was a 34 year veteran caseworker for the state of Nebraska, who just got really fed up with the way the state was treating kids in their care and custody. And all of a sudden, right after I graduated college, decided to run for office. Um, and like a lot of kids from Omaha, she gets elected uh, and I immediately leave town and go to Chicago for law school. And I thought I would stay in Chicago forever. I was really excited about policy work. And so I got my dream job out of law school working at a nonprofit that did maternal and infant health policy. Basically, I was trying to get health care for moms and babies in the state of Illinois. Uh, and I was there for a month. And my sister Carrie actually passed away back home. And I had a really great grief counselor in Chicago who told me not to make any big decisions for a year. But then when that year was up, I just knew uh, that everything that I cared about and everyone that I loved was back home in Omaha. So I moved home. Uh, but when you move home in your late 20s, a lot of your friends have left for grad school or they've gotten married and they have kids and they don't wanna hang out with you. And so I spent a lot of time following my mom around to different events uh, as she was concluding her term in the legislature. And at almost every event, people would come up to me and just talk to me about how they had helped my family after Carrie died when I was still in Chicago going through my own grief journey. And so 
uh, when I decided to run for office, it really wasn't about uh, an incredible salary. We don't make very much as senators. We make about $12,000 a year. Um, but for me, it was giving back to a community that has been remarkable to my family. And so even though I have uh, 40,000 bosses who don't always agree with each other or me, um, I take this job very seriously. And I feel uh, very much that this is a, this is a, a true calling. I think public service is a true calling. Uh, and I feel very fortunate. I've had the opportunity to make history in Nebraska. It was the first time that a daughter ever replaced her mother in the history of the state in the legislature. Uh, and I'm the youngest female chair uh, in leadership right now. So Nebraska has offered me so much in terms of public service, but I will admit that this was not the path that I thought I would be on um, if you had talked to me even 10 years ago, but I'm very happy to be on it. Uh, thank you, Senator Howard. Uh, now, Ms. Shelton, what motivated you to get involved in politics? Uh, well, I want to also echo the thanks to everyone for putting this on today and all the work that goes behind the scenes. I am really good at working behind the scenes, and so I understand everything that uh, happens and, and the intention that had to be set for this to happen today. So thank you for having me. Uh, I was raised by um, a single mother, but I was blessed to have my parents uh, in you know, as a youth. And both of my parents have always kind of raised us to uh, fight for justice and equality, no matter what, no matter who anyone is, and also connect to your purpose and servant others. And so they just kind of believe that servant leadership is what we do. And so uh, when I went to Xavier University of Louisiana, and I found out that there were young individuals that were not able to pass the LEAP test, that's a test that second graders have to take. And um, I started tutoring them. And then I started just finding more issues that were happening in the community. And I was really passionate about finding a way to get involved. Uh, and so I came back to Omaha after grad school, took a little bit of a break to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and started serving again. Um, I ended up joining Delta Sigma Theta sorority. And I started first doing letter writing parties and teaching people who their senators are. And hey, you know, even if you didn't vote for them, it doesn't matter what party you are in, they are still representing you and really just working hard to motivate individuals. Then that es escalated to me going to DC and doing workshops and uh, learning how to support campaigns and how to testify and how to write a legislative agenda. And the entire time I did not realize I was training myself to run for an office. I thought I need to be this voice and help my community and ensure that there's equality and whatever we want to be done, like make sure our voices are heard. Uh, and so it was a shock to me that I decided to run for that office, but I felt very compelled uh, with counseling the amount of individuals, specifically adolescents I was counseling while working in Winnebago uh, and people here where I was volunteering back in Omaha that were really affected by the police shooting, uh, the mass shootings that were going around everywhere. I graduated in 1999 as well, Senator Howard. I graduated from Burke and Columbine happened in 1999 and I just not, could not believe, I would, could not fathom that school, which was my safe place, ended up not being a safe place for many youth at this moment. I didn't grow up in the school shooting era. I thankfully graduated around that time. And so uh, when I saw that Senator Sass was taking money from the NRA and the amount of money, and when I saw that we could put precautions in place and introduce a bill for a dog to protect a dog from dying on a United Airlines flight, but we could not do that for students who were fearful. I just jumped into action and I have been speaking and running ever since. And so I just want to put a plug out there for anyone that is motivated. Make sure you follow your passion. If you speak up, if you let your voice be heard, anything can happen. All right, thank you, Ms. Shelton. Now, our next question that we're gonna throw out to two of you is what was the most positive uh, outcome of your campaign or um, campaign that you've worked on? So, you know, a lot of you have been in campaigns and some of you have worked on campaigns. So what was the most positive thing that you experienced uh, while working on a campaign? Whoops, Senator Howard, please go. Oh, sure. Um, so I, 
let's see, I managed my mom's campaign in 2004, which was a very different experience because if you've ever worked on a campaign for someone you love, and I know um, Ms. Thibodeau can talk about this, you're, you're very protective of your loved one. <laughs> like uh, I, would, I would start asking people to not bother my mom at the grocery store and my mom would be like, no, I'm, I'm into it. Let's talk to everybody. Uh, but it was a very different story when I ran in 2012. I'll be honest, I'm actually um, an introvert. I'm shy in a lot of ways. Um, if you, uh, a lot of my childhood stories are like, everybody was hanging out and then Sarah was in the other room reading a book. Um, most of them are go like that. Uh, and so I really had to overcome a lot of that shyness when I was, and build up confidence when I was running. Um, and so for me, I don't love public speaking. Uh, I don't, uh, uh, I don't love sort of big crowds and I also don't love attention. These are things that um, most politicians or people in the political arena uh, kind of eat for breakfast and that's not um, that's not me. And so I had to really understand that my strengths were uh, talking to people one on one, uh, really listening, um, and then growing in confidence that those strengths were going to be the things that made a difference on election day and they truly did. And then subsequently they've made a difference in the legislature. Um, I don't speak on the microphone very often, uh, but when I do people listen because they know that I've thought about what I'm going to say. Um, and they know that I've uh, been considerate and measured in how I'm voting and how I'm moving. Uh, and so I think things like that where what's been exciting over the past eight, 10 years that I've been doing this and what's been the best part of campaigning is actually understanding how much I've grown as a person and how much it's forced me to grow in ways that have been really wonderful and unexpected. Thank you, Senator Howard. Now, Ms. Thibodeau, what's the most positive thing you've experienced either on your own campaign or working for another campaign? Well, Senator Howard does uh, describe uh, things well as you do tend to take things personally uh, when you are working for somebody you love. So I would get very defensive of my sister as well. And on the flip side, when I was running, she would get very defensive of me and I would go, oh, it's okay. No, I, I should go. Why don't I just go talk to this person and, and we can come to a common ground. And that brings me to, I think that's probably one of the most positive things that have come out of campaigning is you meet a lot of different people, you get a lot of different viewpoints, and you can sit down and have conversations with anybody and everybody and realize that you may not always agree 100% of the time. I don't think there's two people in this world that can agree 100% of the time, but you can always find common ground. You can always find a commonality with each other, something that you're both passionate about. And you can talk about the best way to address either those issues or the things that you're excited about. And sometimes people may have different ways of getting to the end result, but a lot of us, our end result is the same. And it's refreshing on campaigns and when you're out meeting people that you get to have those conversations and you get to know that when you do get into office, you're the one who gets to take those conversations that you've heard and you get to do great things for the community that you serve. And it did take me a while as well to come out of my shell. And I would say the biggest hurdle I had to overcome was walking up and knocking on somebody's door that I didn't even know. And I wasn't sure if they were going to yell at me or hug me. So <laughs> uh, the nice thing is, is we are in Nebraska and nobody really yells at you. Everybody is always very pleasant and very nice. And it does make your confidence grow, which as a female, I think that's a wonderful thing. Okay, thank you, Ms. Thibodeau. Now here's the flip side of the coin. And this question is, what was the most difficult part of either your campaign or a campaign you've worked on? And Ms. Shelton, we'll go to you first. Uh, thank you. So I think the most difficult part of campaigning was absolutely COVID and adjusting to COVID. Prior to that and helping on, in the other campaigns, I would say fundraising because you know we're always talking about money and everybody on the campaign is talking about money and you wanna make sure if you're volunteering that you're motivating people to give and just introduce them to the candidate and let them know who it is. Uh, and as a candidate, uh, it took us some time to navigate just reading what the CDC said when COVID hit, that was really challenging, but I am very, very pleased with 
what campaigns are doing now and what we've been able to find out virtually that we can access and do. Uh, and so it's, it's almost like learning a new area. And I, I love learning new things and challenges. And so that was one of our biggest challenges. Thank you, Ms. Shelton. Uh, so Ms. Waldo, we'll go to you next. What was the most difficult thing that you've done when you've worked on a campaign? And we know that you were working on a campaign back in what, 20, 2008 in Iowa. Yeah, I don't envy the group of campaign workers uh, going through COVID right now. I, my heart goes out to all of them because uh, campaigns are already so grueling. Uh, you know, after President Obama won the primary in Iowa in 2008, uh, I was sent all over the country to help open up our campaign offices uh, from South Carolina to Ohio to Pennsylvania, everywhere. Uh, so I basically lived out of this like duffel bag uh, and slept on strangers' couches uh, for months. So that takes a toll on you. Uh, but at the same time, you know, during a presidential campaign, during the primaries, you know, you have these really, really, really exciting highs, right? Like when you win a state, there's this huge rush of excitement. Uh, but then you have to pack up your bag and go to the next state and like start all over again. Uh, and in that state, it might not go so well. And you have these like crushing defeats and lows. Uh, and, and a skill you have to have is to be able to just bounce back really quick. Um, so anybody right on, on a sports team right now, a debate team, you know, show choir, like, you know what that's like to like lose one day and then get right back on the field or in the, in the choir and the the course room to like start practicing like that is the skill that you need to be a part of a campaign okay thank you Ms. Waldo and now we have a question and Ms. Dibigo touched on this a little bit when she was talking about working on a campaign but Senator Howard my question for you is in politics how do you cooperate or form consensus with different parties and different uh, points of view uh, thank you for the question and I actually um uh, I would, I'm fairly well known for building consensus in the legislature. Um, I've chaired the Health and Human Services Committee for two years now, and 90% of the votes that we've sent out have been unanimous out of the committee. And I have a majority of folks on my committee who are not of the same party as me. Um, uh, but I think I work really hard to make sure that everybody's heard. The most important thing for building consensus and to getting to that unanimous vote truly for me, I found is that you have to agree that there's a problem in the first place. So uh, the best example I have and what I'm known for uh, nationally is work that I've done around opioid addiction and opioid overdose death prevention. Um, when my sister Carrie died, uh, she had been addicted to prescription pain medication for several years. Uh, things had gotten better and then they'd gotten worse. And uh, when we finally lost her, it was really heartbreaking. And my mom was serving in the legislature at the time. And it was really the beginning of the, the national conversation around opioid addiction and opioid abuse. And so what I had to challenge myself to do was I really didn't want to talk about it. Um, but then I realized that when I talked about my story and my experience with Carrie, uh, more people could agree with me that there was a problem in our state. And so when we could get to that agreement that there was a problem, it was a lot easier to build statutory solutions around that problem. And so for me, when I think about building consensus, you know, there are key things that you have to have, right? Agree there's a problem, but also have those relationships. When I talk about being an introvert and being able to work with people one-on-one, -on -one, that's really critical because then they'll listen to you when you tell your story. And so, you know, consensus is not an easy thing to do, but I will say that women in particular, we are incredibly good at it. Uh, and it shows in the work that has come out of our legislature recently from, from women in particular. Thank you for the question. Whoops. I will also tell you, Senator Howard, that research does support that women are able to come to get together on consensus across party lines. My next question is for Ms. Thibodeau. And this is another question that you get oftentimes for uh, young women or women in general thinking about running for political office. So Ms. Thibodeau, how does a job in politics affect your personal life and your family life? And part of that, you know, how does it affect it? And how do you maintain that balance between a political life and a family life? I think that is a great question and I, I visualizing my daughter kind of laughing right now, but uh, it does affect it, obviously. However, what I have seen in our family is it has affected it in a positive way. Yes, 
we're busy. We're a busy family, just like every other family is. But what my children are seeing, I have three of them, two are girls. What they are seeing is that as a woman, I can have a career. I can be a wonderful mother, still care about my children and still be passionate and involved in politics and make a difference. And what that is showing them is you can do those things. You have to work hard. Do we have to sometimes put, you know, family events on our calendar? Or there's just some days where I tell my girls, hey, let's just go hang out for the day and we'll just go do fun things. We kind of like to go shopping sometimes and, and we just have fun uh, doing things like that. And so it's remembering to carve out special time. Um, I'll do the same with my son. We also try, uh, again, three teenagers. Well, one's almost a teenager. It's also hard with their schedules, but the nights that we can do our family dinners, even if it's I come home from work and I sit down and have family uh, dinner with the family and we get to talk about each other's days and then I may have to go back out and do some other meetings. Those things are just very important to remember and you can do it as long as you do it with intention and you make sure that you do carve out time for everyone in the family, not just the children, but my husband as well. And I think we do a pretty good job at that. And it also allows us for good discussions. I would say we are never at a lack of things to talk about at our dinner table. And it makes the children think and they start forming opinions and they look at their values and we have really good discussions. So. Although busy, I think it really has had a positive effect on the family. Thank you, Ms. Thibodeau. Now we're gonna explore gender a little bit more with the next two questions. And the first one was with uh, Ms. Shelton and maybe kind of even reflecting on your campaign uh, for in the Democratic primary. As a woman, have you experienced reporters asking you questions focusing on how your personal life will affect your ability to serve uh, compared to your male counterpart? Absolutely. Uh, and so I am really, really great at pivoting. Uh, and so when there's a question that is just something that I feel like is, you know, asked to me in a negative light because I'm a woman, I just don't answer it. <laughs> I will just like smile. And if, especially I love when reporters ask two or three part questions, then I just act like that's one that I forgot. Uh, but the biggest thing that I noticed, which was the most frustrating is that they seem to always place questions with intentions around me and the other woman that ran in the race uh, as a Democrat, Angie Phillips. And so it was, so, you know, questions like, oh, do you guys talk or are you guys bickering or is there, you know, really, just really different things. And uh, as Katie mentioned earlier, most women, we've been on teams, like I played basketball growing up, I can be a really good team player. And also, as a therapist, I'm really great at uniting. And so I can talk, I have people in my family that are Republicans. Uh, I'm a Democrat. That doesn't mean that we don't love each other. <laughs> it just means that we have interesting conversations. And it also means that we're willing to come together at moments and say, hey, this is what's important to me, what's important to you. So we see each other. Um, so I always had to speak about how I did not have any ill will against her. I was, I admired the fact that a woman got into this race. I was happy that she was in the race with me. And so that was something that I constantly had to talk down against. Um, and interestingly enough, the role that people would take with my husband, like wanting to know what our relationship was like. And so I definitely never answered those questions either. <laughs> Being a great way to handle things in a, in a debate as well. The next question is for Ms. Waldo. And does being female, Ms. Waldo, affect how you view your work uh, or uh, in regard to certain issues or outcomes? So this is more like thinking of yourself as a, a woman. Does that uh, affect how you uh, view your work and what you've been involved in with the campaigns you've been involved in? Yeah, I appreciated this question. It was a good one for me to think about. Uh, and what I was reflecting on is, is I think being female definitely affects how I'm thinking about and responding to the current COVID crisis. Um, you know, there's a lot of new research showing that women and especially women of color are more likely to have been laid off or furloughed during the COVID crisis. Um, and, and, you know, many women right now are, are even what they're 
calling like downshifting, right? Like downshifting their careers or leaving the workforce completely because of homeschooling needs or um, to take care of family members. Um, and I think that we're gonna see the side effects of this for years to come. Uh, you know, companies are at the risk of uh, you know, losing women in, in leadership and future women leaders and, and potentially unwinding years of progress. So at my organization at We The Action, you know, we've taken certain steps to ensure that staff can have flexible work hours and that they can work from home and, and that we can provide then legal help to hundreds of nonprofit organizations that also might be struggling right now. Uh, so that's that's kind of how I'm, I'm thinking of this right now. Okay, thank you, Ms. Waldo. Now, as you can well imagine, the students here at the Catholic high schools were interested in faith and politics. So I'm just going to ask one question in that for all of you. We're going to start with Ms. Thibodeau. But the question from the students is, um, how does your religious affiliation affect your political views? Well, it absolutely does affect my political views uh, in some ways. Obviously, the Lord teaches us to be kind, generous people. And so you want to be gracious, not be selfish. I look at those types of things. I also look at the values that my faith has uh, instilled in me from the time I was a child. And when I'm looking at policies or candidates, I'm looking at, is this candidate going to protect the most innocent of individuals? Will they protect the most innocent lives? Will they look at infringing upon religious freedom? We want to make sure that we do not infringe on any religious freedom anywhere. And so really looking at those types of things, making sure we keep government out of religion, uh, allowing people to worship freely, allowing churches to stay open and allowing us to use the Lord as our guide and that's how you get through a lot of life decisions. We, we pray a lot and really you need to put, put the Lord first. And in my mind, it's, it's the Lord, my family, and then politics comes afterwards. And without that and without the faith, I think it's very hard to make good decisions. Thank you, Ms. Thibodeau. We'll go next to Senator Howard. Uh, thank you. So this was an interesting question for me because I don't really follow a faith tradition. My mom raised us Lutheran, but she was a single parent raising two kids by herself because my dad was killed in a car accident right before I was born and my sister was five. And so she had a lot on her plate when she was raising us. And so faith wasn't really a conversation that we had. Um, what I feel really lucky about, though, is that when I was in eighth grade, my sister woke me up one Saturday morning and was like, get up, you're taking a test. And she drove me to Duchenne and I took the test and I got in. And for four years, I had the opportunity to watch people and, and be surrounded by a community of people who were living out their faith every day, who really followed goal three of the Sacred Heart, which is uh, a social awareness that impels to action. And whether their calling was... Um, you know, helping out uh, by educating young women. Uh, it was, it was, or working in the community out, outside of Duchenne. I feel very fortunate that I was able to be exposed to them for four years because watching people truly live out their faith and watching them truly see that social awareness that moves you to action is something that inspired me. And it, and it was something that I was able to take with me to the legislature. And so while I personally don't follow a, a faith tradition in the sense that um, I'm Catholic or Lutheran or go to church every week, um, by, by being exposed to people who do have that deep, deep faith tradition, uh, it's really had an impact on the way that I serve in the legislature and the way that I will serve in the future. So I feel very lucky to have gone to Duchenne, sincerely. Thanks, Senator Howard. Uh, we'll go to Ms. Waldo next. Thank you. So uh, I grew up Catholic and uh, I, I used to love the parable of the Good Samaritan. So I think I'm inspired by our political leaders that, that share that belief and, and treat others as they would want to be treated, no matter political party or religious beliefs. Uh, and, and on a personal note, I, I had people judge me for my decision to work for President Obama. Uh, they actually showed up to Mercy to protest me for some reason uh, when I started at the White House. 
Uh, and that was that was really hurtful um, because for me, being Catholic does not mean I have to vote for for one party or the other. Okay, thank you, Ms. Waldo. And now, Ms. Shelton. Thank you. So um, I grew up as a, under the Baptist faith. Uh, and then I attended Xavier University, which is a, the only historically black college that is Catholic. It was founded by the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament in the 70s. And so um, I actually joined the gospel choir. Uh, I studied theology. And what I found is that faith in itself is healthy. It actually uh, didn't matter what people identified as, as long as they believed in something, because that ended up being their moral compass. And so I kind of shifted to a more interdenominational faith where I now focus on my relationship and my spirituality. And the way that I do everything in the morning, I am very connected to God. Uh, I believe in the commandments and the top two commandments, which it states in the Bible are the greatest. And so that is love thy God with all thy heart and to love thy neighbors. And I really take that personal. And so if you go anywhere with me, my husband will tell you and my family will tell you that pre-COVID, if I met someone in the grocery store, I am talking to them and I wanna know how they're doing. And when I ask someone how they're doing, I really want to know. And that was something that was really to the advantage on the campaign trail because I got to learn stories, very personal stories. I get to ask people about how their grandbabies are doing, how this person who was in the hospital is doing, and I get to pray for them. And so that's the greatest honor that can be bestowed to me. Uh, but I also am able to keep it separate because if I love my neighbor, I want the best thing for my neighbor. I don't want to influence them. I want to tell their story. I want to amplify their voice and make sure that they can be healthy and have the American dream. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Our next question, again, this is for all of you as well. And we're going to start with you, Ms. Waldo. But the question is, and I'm sure uh, this is something that always young women are really interested in, but what is your advice to young women who either aspire for a career in politics or maybe in another male dominated field. So uh, Ms. Waldo, what's your advice? Yeah, thank you. This is my favorite question. Uh, and I, I give the same feedback to, to women all the time. Uh, it was a few years ago, I, I read this report that said that men apply for a job when they meet only 60% of the qualifications, but women apply for that job only if they meet 100% of the qualifications. So, right, that says that like men are so confident in their ability at 60% of the job that they apply. But as women, we don't feel confident until, right, we've checked like every single thing off of that list. So I always say this and then I have to give like a parenthesis that says like, I'm not saying you should apply to be a doctor without going to med school. Like you do need to check a few things off the list but I do want you to have faith in yourself and what you can do. And if you want to do something, you know, don't create this list of like why you shouldn't do it. Uh, instead, you know, seek out women in those roles, ask for their advice, listen to what they say uh, and, and put in the work. And then you should apply for whatever position that is you want. Okay, thank you, Ms. Waldo. We'll now go to um, Senator uh, Howard. Um, okay, so I had a couple of things. I also really loved this question and I was really glad that it was asked. Um, the first one was I had a mentor in Chicago who would constantly remind me if I was nervous or worried about trying something new or doing something that put myself out there. She's like, just feel that fear and then do it anyway. And I'm and she wasn't talking about the fear of like walking down a dark alley at night. Like that's not the kind of fear she's talking about. It's the fear that comes from doubt or the fear that comes from maybe shame from failure. That's the kind of fear that you have to sort of feel it, recognize it and then move on from it. Um, I also talk a lot about if women want to be involved in politics, if if the girls who are watching this um, want to want to really uh, move the needle, uh, helping on campaigns is really important. Uh, it's a great uh, place to learn. Um, but what's really important too is it's a great place for you to consider your values and then see if you can find somebody that you can work for and help um, uh, that matches those values. And then finally, I'll say, I have a really hard time when we talk about um, 
male dominated fields. Uh, so when I was, uh, I, and I always illustrate everything with stories, so I apologize. This is the last one, I promise. Um, mm -hmm. When I was 13 years old, I was playing Atari in our basement and listening to the radio, it was Sweet 98. And on the radio came a commercial for uh, an aviation group and they said, do you wanna learn how to fly planes? If you wanna learn how to fly planes, your first time will be free. And I ran upstairs and I was like, mom, I wanna learn how to fly planes, I wanna do that. And she was like, well, if you set it up, I'll drive you to the airport and you can first time's free. And then subsequently for the next five years, uh, way before I had a learner's permit or a driver's license, I would fly planes and I became a pilot. And often you think of flying planes and being a pilot uh, as a male dominated field, but it never occurred to my mom to say, no, that's what boys do, right? I grew up with a parent who said, there are no fields that aren't for you. And so I worry sometimes when we think about male dominated field, fields versus female dominated fields, because I don't think there should be any. I think politics, engineering, flying planes, these are all fields that should be uh, as dominated by women as we perceive them to be dominated by men. And so I refuse to believe that there are any fields where women shouldn't be involved uh, and shouldn't be a part of the narrative for them. So thank you for the question. Thanks, Senator Howard. We'll go next to Ms. Shelton. And again, what, are your, what is your advice for young women aspiring either to be in politics or male dominated fields, and there are no male dominated fields, but if you think there are, uh, what should, would you be your advice for young women? Um, so I like to always uh, encourage young women to think about who you are uplifting. And, so, <clears throat> excuse me. And so that would be identifying, do you have a younger sister? Do you have individuals that are younger than you? The, is there a specific population that you are attracted to that you wanna make sure that they are represented? Um, and so I always find that it's easy for me to uh, chair for myself and increase my confidence and negotiate and know that I'm always gonna do at least 10% counter in which you're offering me uh, because I want to set the position for the next person coming through. Uh, and so I'm going to share a really small story. I grew up in New York. My dad is a musician and he's an artist and oh, he's one of those floating personalities, right? Who's just all about being free. And I really wanted to play the drums when I was little because I loved Sheila E. And I loved listening to her. And when I went to join the band at my elementary school, uh, the instructor told me, well, you know, women can only play the flute or the clarinet in my band. And I didn't understand that. And so I went to my dad and he was like, well, you know, baby, you have two options. You can follow what he says and prove him wrong. And you can slowly reach out and learn other, you know, um, instruments because just because you play one of these instruments now doesn't mean that you're limited to this instrument or you can walk away and then he'll never learn a lesson. And so I always think about what can I teach because our society has not done a good job in showing that there's equality across the board. We are now learning that gender is fluid. Uh, people can choose what their gender are, and I'm excited that they have the right to do so in our country. And so it, I think it's helpful to put a personal note to it and think, who do you represent and who do you want to uplift and what is important to you? Because no matter where I go, I am always holding and honoring the women who could not be where I was and are not in the rooms that I'm in. Thank you, Ms. Shelton. And finally, we'll go with uh, you, Ms. Thibodeau. Again, what advice do you have for young women aspiring for a career in politics or maybe a field that seems to be dominated by men? Yes, absolutely. And thank you. And what I would say to the young women, um, if you are looking at a career or politics and, and the first thing that comes to your mind is, oh, I think that's a field dominated by men. Get that thought out of your head as quickly as it comes in. There are no fields dominated by men as far as we're concerned, because no matter what you want to do, if you work hard enough and you put the effort in, you can succeed. And that's the attitude you need to have, whether you're going into a meeting with all men. And so the first thing we do, we do, we check that box and go, well, do I know 100% of everything that I'm walking into? Just know that you will be heard in that meeting. You need to stay true to yourself and don't let anybody over talk you. And as long as you are true to yourself, 
you walk in with confidence and you keep that confidence, whether you are the minority gender in the room, uh, you're a minority political party in the room, just keep your confidence, stay true to your values and know that what is on your mind is needs to be heard. And women offer the greatest uh, perspective to things. Our, our minds work really well because we're so used to multitasking that we don't get on like a one track mind thing. And so we're so good at finding different ways to solve problems. And as we continue to do that, and as we continue to not have the mindset of male dominated industries, and we just go and achieve what we want to achieve, we are going to continue to break those barriers. Thank you, Ms. Thibodeau. All great answers and just really, I'm sure, inspiring to the students in today. Now, the students also gave a list of questions because they want to get to know you as people. And by the way, we're doing really well on time, so we may add another question from our list of extra questions. But this question is just a fun one. And this is, what is your favorite food? And we're going to start with uh, Ms. Shelton. Uh, so my favorite food is typically salmon. However, I have to throw out that my mom's macaroni and cheese, it doesn't matter what I'm following. If I'm on a special diet, that is comfort food for me, specifically if she makes it, that is my absolute best favorite, feel like I'm at home anytime I eat it type of food. Uh, Ms. Thibodeau, what is your favorite food? Sorry, my mute button would not come off. Well, I'm gonna have to give two because one's technically not a food, but I would say my most favorite thing is Reese's peanut butter cups with a Pepsi. <laughs> so in fact, uh, I think I ate a lot of those when pregnant, but when I actually need nutrition, my favorite food is steak. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ms. Thibodeau. So we'll next go to Senator Howard. What is your favorite food? Uh, I'm also going to give two because I cannot commit to one, but number one is and always will be nachos in all <laughs> forms. <laughs> like I have, I have no discrimination for nachos, every one of them. I love them all equally, but I will, my second one, and this is new, during COVID quarantine, my husband got really into baking and he started making bagels at home. Oh my gosh, it's revolutionary, game-changing. If he had been able to do this when we were dating, we would have been married a lot sooner. I would say. <laughs> I'm just saying. So yes, nachos and then those homemade Doug Schroeder bagels. Mm, amazing. Sounds great. Okay, Ms. Waldo, what's your favorite food? Yes. Well, I am jealous of you all for being in Omaha right now, because usually what happens when I go back to Omaha, right, I land at the airport, my parents pick me up, and our first stop is Mama's Pizza, because <laughs> Mama's Pizza and their onion rings, that combo is my, my favorite food, hands down. So I, I'm dreaming of it now. <laughs> Those all sound really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, our, our maybe last question, we're just about time. We might have another one. If I do, by the way, I'll throw it out. If we have time for one more question, it's going to be who was your biggest political inspiration? Just name a person. So, but our next question is that I gave you in advance is what did you study in college? And do you wish that you would have studied something else? And we're going to start with Senator Hunt. I studied American history and I love American history. I specialized in uh, women in America between 1890 and 1910, which is a really interesting time for women. Uh, uh, it, was, it was part of that suffrage era um, and sort of the seeds were being planted. And so, no, I don't wish I had studied anything else because history, like I get really excited by history and it also informs so much of what I do now. Um, so no, I'm very happy with my college major. Great. Okay, Ms. Waldo, you're next. What did you study in college and do you wish you would have studied something different? Similar. So my uh, background is journalism and justice and peace studies. Uh, and I absolutely wouldn't change that. Uh, I, I think a journalism background actually taught me how to effectively share a message. Um, and I think that's important in politics and, you know, in everyday tweets and emails and text messages, like you have to be able to get your point across. Well, I'm going to uh, 
uh, agree with Katie. That's my background in <laughs> journalism. Although then I never really worked very long as a journalist. But uh, uh, Ms. Thib Ms. Thibodeau, you're next. What, what, what did you study in college and do you wish you would have studied uh, something different? Yes, so I studied psychology in college and absolutely do not wish that I would have studied anything different. That major has taught me how to interact with people uh, and as well as interact with children. It has helped me in all of my careers. It's also helped me as a mom and a wife. So glad I majored in it and wouldn't change it for the world. All great majors coming out here. So Ms. Shelton, you're last. And so what did you major in in college and do you wish you would have majored in something different? Uh, so my major was psychology pre-medicine. My minor was chemistry and biology. Um, and so I never, I live my life with no regrets. I love it. I think that it allowed me to build the relationship, although it was very heavy in the science. One thing that I have been inspired to do since my last run is to study the constitution. And one great thing about life is you always can do whatever you want to do. And so mm -hmm. in the pandemic, there are virtual online learning classes and I started my first one and I'm very excited about that opportunity. And so uh, I think it, we also have to remember that there's always room for growth. You can always learn something new, change something, grow more in an area, and I'm excited to do that. Okay, I do think we, unless Ms. Fisk, we have 10 minutes left, so I think we have time for one more question. And like I uh, gave you a little bit in advance, I mean, a lot of times women talk, you know, when they get involved in politics or even in a career, they have someone that inspired them, and it may be more than one person. So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to start with um, Ms. Waldo, is just uh, to be thinking about it, that who inspired you? Uh, so the, who are your biggest, I guess, political inspirations? So we're thinking about the world of politics and how you've been involved in politics and who inspired you to get involved in that world. And we'll start with Ms. Waldo. I think it's mo no surprise probably that my answer is gonna be uh, President Obama. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I didn't get into politics thinking that President Obama was gonna be president someday, right? Like when I started on his campaign, Nobody knew how to pronounce his name. Nobody knew who he was. I would knock on somebody's door and they'd be like, oh, he sounds nice. Like, what's he running for? Like school board? No, the president of the United States. So, I mean, I was just inspired by the fact that he brought in a whole new generation of people who now care about politics, like myself, who never thought that that would be something that they would be spending their life doing. Okay, thank you. We'll go next to Ms. Thibodeau. So who was your political inspiration? I would say on a very high level, presidential wise, uh, my biggest inspiration is President Ronald Reagan. Uh, but I also think that uh, down ballot candidates and, and political candidates are actually very, very important. And so my biggest inspiration there would be my sister who put her name out there. Again, nobody knew who she was at all. And just to see the work that she did to get elected, to watch what she does on the city council to help the city of Omaha has been amazing. And um, I always hope that I can uh, fill her shoes as well as she does. Great. Um, Ms. Shelton, we'll go to you next. So who were your political uh, inspirations or who are your inspirations today? Um, and so my inspirations are two of my lovely sorority sisters, uh, Shirley Chisholm, for obvious reasons. She is the first woman to run for president as a woman of color. Um, I always feel that I clearly um, can conquer anything because women before me have been working really, really hard. And let's just talk about how women had to work to even get the right to vote. And so there's so much in there. And I always, always think about having a seat at the table and the tables that I get to sit at that my ancestors did not. Uh, the person who inspires me in the passion part is Fannie Lou, Ham Fannie Lou Hamer, who is also uh, a member of Delta Sigma Theta. And so interestingly enough, in this weird roundabout way, I've been able to find these connections where I'm like, hey, wait a minute there must be something that we're sparking that I didn't even realize I was a part of. And so that has been really inspirational for me. Okay, Senator Howard, please let us know who your political inspiration uh, was or still is. Well, now that we get two, this is great. Um, yes. so I'm a big old nerd. Uh, so I'm gonna say my historical figure is George Norris. He's the godfather of the legislature, uh, of the unicameral legislature. Listen, we have the best 
state government in the country, hands down. Uh, we're nonpartisan. We're, my vote counts just as much as the next person, uh, which is great when you're a young woman in the legislature, um, but he really just created a, a legislature, a state governing body where there are no um, political parties to influence us. We work for the people that voted for us, that sent us there. Um, and so it is really the best form of government um, in the world, I would argue. Um, but then just for a personal hero, I would not have run for office if I hadn't seen my mom do it. And my mom was a perfectly normal person who had had a lot of struggles and a lot of tragedy. I mean, she, and I mentioned this before, but she raised my sister and I by herself after my dad was killed in a car accident. She worked as a social worker for 34 years for the state of Nebraska, not making a lot of money. And when she decided to run for office, everyone told her that she was going to lose. And it was my mom, my sister and I, we talked to every single voter, knocked on every single door. Um, and because I saw her be brave in that way, um, it made it less scary for me when I decided that I was going to take that risk and run for office as well. And so, you know, you can't be it if you can't see it. And I got really lucky that the person that I could see doing it was so close to me um, and so fearless when she decided to do it. So I would say my mom, Gwen Howard, who's also up for election today, but she's on a <laughs> Well, thank you, Senator. We texted each other this morning. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and she's well, like, oh, tell you, my uh, opponent we're, dropped out. So <laughs> we're, we're doing great so far. Good. Well, we were a little nervous yesterday when we met in advance that we had so many questions. But I'm going to turn it over now into Miss Sisson. We're right at 1256. And so thank you for doing such a great job. Uh, and I am going to turn it over to Miss Sisson. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a wonderful, wonderful conversation. I love it. And, and Senator Howard, um, you took the words out of my mouth. As, as I was sitting here listening to you, I was thinking of that, that old adage, if you can see it, you can be it. I mean, isn't that, it, it's so, so true. And, and I just think there are so many different ways to get involved in politics. And all of you have shown our students some of those possibilities. And I'm so, so grateful for that. And I just keep thinking too, you know, 15 or 20 years from now, the girls who are watching this presentation today will be telling their own stories about how they've made a difference. And so I wanna thank you for inspiring them. So thank you, thank you. Um, we're so grateful to all of you. So thank you.